I'd like to repeat Matt's welcome to Recover Retrenched Reset. And as Matt said, I'm uh, Robin Green, Chair of Research Libraries UK. This event is being facilitated by Research Libraries UK on behalf of IARLA. For those of you who are unfamiliar with IARLA, we are a platform for information exchange, collaboration, and for our members to develop shared strategic perspectives and positions. IALA members comprise the Association of Research Libraries, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, the Council of Australian University Librarians, LIBER, the Association of European Research Libraries, and Research Libraries UK. So as Matt said earlier, we have a great range of across the world of, of members. Recover, Retrench, Reset is IRLA's first event and it's an, an important moment for us as that platform co for collaboration. Collaboration has always been important, but now has become mission critical in an increasingly global library environment where decisions, actions and developments in one region can rapidly impact on other regions and where shared information can be built on to strengthen all. So the, the acceleration of progress and the transition to open access is a really positive example of this. Today's information exchange on how we're recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic is unfortunately another. <clears throat> At the recent launch of Research Libraries UK's Digital Shift Manifesto, speaker Masood Kokar quoted from an article in the Harvard Business Review, which stated that, Evolution in the higher education ecosystem happens through punctuated equilibrium. Long periods of relatively slow change interspersed with occasional moments of rapid adaptation. That quotation and its use regarding the digital shift is so relevant to today. This is one such moment, a period of discontinuity that is already driving profound change in society, our institutions, and our libraries. Through Recover, Retrench, Reset, we'll today capture experiences and plans at a point in time to build on knowledge gained. Our speakers will give perspectives from their own and their regional situations on the physical and other impacts the pandemics had on their libraries, their institutions and their communities, how they and their institutions are recovering, and managing under these unprecedented conditions, addressing issues such as, amongst many others, distance service provision and the well being needs of staff returning to the stress of commuting and, and the workplace. Also, how their libraries are planning for the future new normal, for example, in terms of operating models, the acceleration to digital, and potentially, the implications of changed institutional perceptions of the library service and also how they might build in resilience for as we've seen worldwide interconnectedness brings not only great benefits such as a global information ecosystem but also the potential for disruptions on a similar scale and for me one of the many disturbing aspects of this pandemic was the instant loss of both local and collective print collections, the lifeblood of certain academic disciplines, when our physical buildings and interlibrary loan services locked down. One of the many post-COVID questions is how might we prevent this in the future? As you can see from the programme, our speakers have been very deliberately selected to give perspectives on these issues from their different jurisdictions, their different types of institution, institutional contexts and types of library and of course as library directors how they are shaping recovery programs and future plans we expect there will be overlap between the presentations and this will be significant in building a record of shared experience there will also be differentiation and understanding this will also be important as we listen to the speakers and engage in the discussion in the third part of the event, do bear in mind the various factors, geographic, economic, cultural, societal, governmental and others that have played a part in their journey through the pandemic and how that might relate to your journey. Even the weather plays its part 
In the UK, lockdown has been during an unusually benign spring and early summer, and gardens will have been places for escape. In contrast, the recent winter was one of the wettest on record. Ten weeks lockdown at that time may have resulted in very different impact on well-being and productivity for those working at home. A further aspect to consider is that some of our, our speakers are at different stages in the pandemic cycle. So what we hear today will, for some, have practical value in the coming weeks and months, whereas for others it will be acquired knowledge to retain and apply in future when the next discontinuity arrives. And with that cheering thought, I hope you enjoy what will be a, a wide-ranging and stimulating event. And I'll now hand you over to Astrid Verhausen, Executive Director of Lieber, who leads the first session. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I'm indeed here on behalf of Lieber and 440 research libraries across Europe that Lieber represents. And I also welcome you to this first session. Lieber and our libraries are committed to open science. And as we all know, the importance of open science has become even more evident during the current crisis. I'm excited to start this event with the first session that covers case studies from two continents and three countries with three very experienced librarians. Lauren Presley from the United States, Vivian Lewis from Canada, and Helen Shenton from Ireland. I will keep track of time and to remind you, you can ask your questions during the session via the Q&A function. The first speaker of this session is Lauren Presley. Lauren is the Associate Dean of University Libraries for Research and Learning Services at the University of Washington. In this role, she is, among other things, responsible for strategy, policy and progr program development, and overall excellence in access services. Lauren, the screen is yours. Thank you. One moment. And I believe you can see my slide now. So um, thank you Astrid for introducing me and to Matt and Melanie for your help in being here today. I'm very excited to share the work that we've been doing at University of Washington and to hear from colleagues across um, other institutions about what this work has looked like there. Um, to set a little bit of context so that uh, you have a sense of where we're coming from, I wanted to share a little bit about the University of Washington. We are a public institution located across three campuses in Seattle, Bothell, and Tacoma, Washington. We're on a quarter system, so in fact, this is our final week of the academic year right now. We have over 59,000 students, confer over 17,000 degrees annually, and are fortunate to receive 1.5 billion in sponsored grants and research. The UW Libraries within that context has a one library, three campus model. We employ 355 staff, 330 student staff. We have 16 locations with 5 million annual visitors and have the largest library collection in the Pacific Northwest with about 9 million, more than 9 million um, items in the collection. Some local context for what COVID-19 has looked like in Washington state is that we were the first identified state in the US to have a case of COVID back in January. Um, and I put the timeline here roughly just so that you can have a sense of how things escalated within Washington. But along the way, there's some other things that might be of interest to this particular audience, which is on March 2nd, students petition to close the University of Washington and that petition drew thousands of signatures. By March 6th, the University of Washington president announced that classes would no longer meet the following Monday. So faculty had about a day to prepare for that transition. Another important piece of local context is we're entering into our fifth day of protest within the city. We have National Guard presence and we're operating under a curfew. So as you might imagine, though COVID-19 continues to be a significant part of our day-to-day -day work and figuring out how we'll uh, ramp back up to normal services, uh, right now, it has actually taken a backseat to these local um, issues that we're all trying to navigate and figure out um, the best path forward um, through. Um, also, hot off the press, yesterday, as I was closing my computer for the day, I got a notice that the governor had announced a change in our state's plan and that public libraries, which were not due to open until phase three for the state, now will open in phase two with curbside pickup. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that academic libraries will need to offer that service in phase two, but it does mean our faculty may have the expectation that they would have that service. So we're sort of, um, with, the, with that particular announcement, shifting our way of thinking as well and trying to figure out what um, direction that means that we need to go in and what we need to be prepared for when the state enters into phase two. In terms of the University of uh, Washington Libraries process, I again put a timeline here so you can have a sense of how the library moved through those early days and see how that may or may not map up, match up to whatever happened at your own institution. Um, but I'll also share along the way that there were some key things that really made a major difference in our ability to shift online. Um, we were able to close buildings, most buildings, on the 13th, but we had a few days in which we allowed students in our undergraduate library as they were wrapping up exams. So we have a data point where we were very clear with our patrons about how to use the space and how to physically distance, and we saw that that was not followed. So that data became a really important piece for us in thinking about when we would be ready to open and welcome people back into the buildings. We also have an organizational development officer who spent a lot of energy creating telework support, training, uh, creating infrastructure to collect projects that student employees could do remotely, et cetera, to sort of ease that transition so people could focus on themselves and not having to build infrastructure around the work that they do. And we also had to, um, as many of you may have experienced, had to develop a, a program to rapidly deploy technology to people who needed them, uh, needed different items to be able to work from home. And this phase that we're in now, and I anticipate it will go through when, when most people are even on campus, we're receiving daily messages from our dean outlining any changes in the COVID-19 scenario. We're having monthly town halls of the entire staff with an open Google Doc where people can share questions they have before, um, before we meet. Um, we're developing rich uh, documentation so people have access to that and deploying t tools like Slack or Microsoft Teams so people can communicate informally. We're also mining transcript data. We're aggregating information coming from social media and liaison email to help, help us define the best paths forward. So we're really using a data-informed approach. But first and foremost, through all of this, we're focused on health safety and the message administration continues to repeat as a mantra is to express generosity and kindness to your colleagues and yourselves. We know this is a really challenging time for everyone and we're trying to encourage people to recognize that we do not expect business as usual. We expect uh, people to pace themselves because we recognize that this is a long marathon ahead. So to have a sense of where we're coming from as we uh, shift into looking at returning to campus, we um, have very easily moved most of our research and scholarly communications operations online. A lot of this is because like you, we've been doing a lot of work preparing for digital and remote interactions with the library for decades. We've had an Ask Us chat client since 2002 and have offered a lot of remote and virtual um, consultations. The biggest shift in this space was moving events online. Um, we, within days, transitioned things that were going to be in person online and have actually found participation has increased. So that has encouraged us to think about when we return to campus, should we be prioritizing some of these events in an online environment, even once we're all back in person, because people were able to find ways to fit that into their lives in a way they might not have been able to fit normal um, drop-in events into their schedules. In terms of teaching and learning, uh, we had a huge amount of infrastructure developed to support online learning, although most of our uh, experience had been going into classrooms and doing face-to-face -face instruction. So the transition really was more on our side, the practice of asynchronous and synchronous um, virtual instruction. And we plan to, even if we are on campus in fall, to continue to recommend faculty use, um, to, to use online learning and use remote um, course materials because we are worried that there's a chance that we'll come back in some capacity and then have to leave again or that some students might choose not to come back and just take online classes for the fall and we want to have an equitable teaching learning and course materials program so that no matter what happens everyone has access to the same materials so we're working with faculty to think about when they can find an alternative to something that might have been in print or is there a way for us to acquire an electronic equivalent of the source that they would prefer to use. In terms of thinking about reentry and uh, the workforce, we are definitely still fully in the everybody is home. Washington State um, 
is beginning to let people into phase two, but it's the King County area where UW is located is still solidly in phase one. So that means really you're only supposed to leave the house for essential activities, and we do not consider any of the work other than checking for uh, leaks and facility issues. Everything else is considered inessential and can be done from home. Um, we are anticipating a phased reentry in which we allow people to return to do um, basic stuff to prepare the spaces for when we are able to offer some services. We have some staff that are eager to get back, and we have faculty who are really ready to have access to collections. So we are trying to lay the groundwork now to allow those staff that are ready to go back and able to, to provide those basic services like curbside pickup that faculty will want. We're also looking at um, how we, once we are in a place where we can reopen, what are the things that we can do to uh, require the physical distancing and PPE that will be necessary? Um, and that, as I'm sure many of you are navigating, is a challenge both in terms of how does one acquire it in an environment where it is not widely available? How do you work within your institution where many departments will have demand for the same materials, et cetera? So that's something that we're still in the early days yet on. Um, though Seattle entered into this earlier than most of the country, we've taken a very, very um, evidence-based and conservative approach to reopening. So I suspect that we'll actually be later than many places um, within the U.S. In terms of the University of Washington Library's approach, I put our general operating principles and things that we're regularly bringing up in our conversations here so you can see I think in terms of uh, our mind within administration, uh, we are very cognizant of the questions and concerns staff have. Communication is a key piece of this work, so we're both trying to frequently find ways to communicate out and create infrastructure to hear the concerns that staff have. It's frequently the same concerns, but we just need to reiterate that we hear it and that it's possible to share that with us and that we will incorporate this thinking into our plans. We also recognize that there's an equity issue in this. That uh, not everyone will be safe returning. People have different health issues. People have different caregiving responsibilities at home. Many people on our campus um, rely on public transit to get to campus, and that in and of itself might be a health risk. So we're cognizant that we'll need to be very careful in the plan that we create so that it, the people who do come in can come in safely. Within my role, something that I'm thinking about a lot also is um, on the cultural side of the library, how to help staff navigate this unimaginable ambiguity that, that we could never have planned for. Um, we're also identifying ways to help the community while continuing to offer extreme flexibility. So we're looking at things such as, can we circulate the portions of the collection that people can't um, access online in a way without allowing people in the building? Um, are there ways that we can offer some of the tools that we've typically offered um, in person through a virtualized environment? I will say that one that silver lining in this entire process has been the focus on generosity and flexibility amongst library staff. We're learning a lot about the loads that our colleagues are carrying even in the best of times, and we're working together to support each other to the best ability that we can. So I'm hopeful personally that that generosity will extend to a time in which we return to something that looks like it's approaching normal. Um, although that might be, in our case, um, at least past fall, we are anticipating that in fall the return will definitely be a phased approach. And our governor frequently references the idea of a dial in which um, we might open up a little bit more and find that we need to dial the dial back. So we recognize that even if things begin to look normal in fall, we have to be ready for the dial to switch back as well. So those are my primary comments from the University of Washington, and I thank you for the opportunity to share these with you today. So thank you, Lauren. Uh, before we go over to the second speaker, I remind you to keep posting your questions in the, the Q&A function. I'm now happy to announce our second speaker, Vivian Lewis. Uh, Vivian is the university University librarian at McMaster University, Canada. She has decades of experience in academic librarianship and is an expert in strategic planning, library assessment, and information literacy. Vivian, the screen is yours.
the restoration of in-person services. And first, I thought I would give you a little bit of context. I speak from a Canadian perspective as a member of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, CARL, uh, which is the voice of the larger research libraries in Canada and a very proud member of IARLA, I should say. Canada, I would say, has been reasonably successful in flattening the curve. We've moved relatively quickly with closing our economies and we tend to be fairly compliant when it comes to following rules and, and all of those things play fairly well in, in the time of a pandemic. Now we, we are in truth a series of, of regional epidemics and some provinces are, are largely untouched while others have been hit much harder. Ontario, uh, the province within which I live and work, remains under a state of emergency at least until the end of this month. And my institution, McMaster, uh, is a mid-sized research intensive university with about 30,000 students, supported by a system of four libraries. And the university has a very strong focus on global health and well-being. Uh, we are known as the birthplace of problem-based learning and evidence-based medicine. And I would say that this focus has permeated the narrative of our reopening discussions. So on March 18th, 2020, I made the difficult decision that many other people on this Zoom have made. That was the decision to close the physical libraries and to direct the entire staff to work from home. And the language that I used was, was chosen very, very deliberately. We have closed our physical locations, but the library remains open. So collections and services have remained online. Um, and I would say that the staff have done some extraordinarily heavy lifting over the last 12 weeks, delivering and enriching the digital library for our users. We negotiated an agreement with the Hadi Trust, Lauren mentioned something very similar, uh, to roll out the emergency temporary access service. And we purchased access to about an additional 400,000 electronic books. And we uh, expedited an implementation that was already underway for a new e-reserve system. And at the same time, we started focusing on our staff. We delivered chairs and headsets and their office plants and at least one goldfish delivered to um, staff members front porches. And we began a process of daily and eventually moving into weekly email updates to the staff and weekly all staff meetings where all, virtually every single staff member joins. We created what we describe as the li library job jar to keep all of our staff working productively and to have some fun while they're doing it. So last week, uh, the university announced that for the sake of the health and safety of our community, the entire fall term will be delivered online. And that message, as you can imagine, made it very clear to all, including the library staff, that our physical return to the library is still very much in the future. We have time to plan well, and that's, that's the good part. Now, I, I want to be uh, very clear the, the work that we're all trying to do right now to reopen our physical libraries is incredibly hard. And I thought about why is it so hard? And, you know, we're planning basically to an uncertain horizon. We don't know when the, where the pandemic is heading, how long it will be with us. And frankly, many of us across Carl and across the world were facing budgetary concerns even before the pandemic began. And so the COVID is really only adding to these woes. And to make matters worse, it's likely that some of the steps that we take now will need to be undone when a second uh, wave of the pandemic arrives in the fall. And it's actually very hard to move a digital first policy when senior university leaders, bless their souls, continue to think of the libraries as the traditional book repository. Carl members mentioned a week or so ago, sometimes it's really hard to be the heart of campus. As well, the age of our buildings limits our ability to enforce physical distancing, the size of our corridors, the air ventilation systems, and finally, 
and probably most importantly, our staff want certainty. And we're just, as leaders, not always able to provide that to them. So how do we make these decisions? My leadership team and I began the process by composing a list of core principles. And here's what we've come up with as a, a working draft. Uh, we think about the health and well-being of our staff and our users first. We'll think about the alignment with the larger university, about basing our decisions on the best evidence that we have at the time, and we'll think about communicating our decisions clearly, about being able to change our direction to retrench on a dime. Uh, we're also thinking about the issues of equity and inclusivity, and Lauren mentioned some of these to you as well. We'll care about using our, our um, budget allocation wisely, and we'll routinely reflect on what we're learning about ourselves and about our organizations to plan for the future once this pandemic is, is um, behind us. Now, alignment. We've, we've also um, spent a lot of time talking about alignment. I'm just trying to get my screen to move here all of a sudden. Ah, thank you. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about alignment, and I thought I would just bring some clarity to this. I routinely have to remind myself and my staff that the library is part of a larger university, and we simply can't go rogue. We can't impose our own testing protocols. We can't impose our own HR policies that divert too far from the central norms. So we're currently shaping discussions around uh, three very, very broadly um, scoped scenarios. What I would describe initially as the return to research, the early return, and what I like to think of as not the new normal, but the next normal. So in terms of um, uh, opening research, like other large Canadian uh, research universities, when the pandemic hit, we closed all of the research labs um, other than those specifically working on COVID. And we're now working to bring those big labs back. And so the push across car libraries um, is to ensure that the library is included in these really pivotal uh, conversations. So for McMaster, we're now moving to spin up two additional services uh, to support research a curbside pickup service and a free archival copying service, both of them targeted specifically to McMaster faculty, graduate students, and postdocs. But at some point, and we don't know when, the number of active COVID cases in our area will drop and the university will decide to welcome back some critical number of students under some very controlled physical distancing protocols. Perhaps we'll invite back all of the graduate students, or perhaps we'll invite back all of the classes with under 50 students. We don't know. But this is the scenario that we like to think of as the early return. So we see uh, three key steps involved in the early return. First, uh, depending on which and how many students are coming back, we'll need to determine which services we can provide and how they will be delivered. Uh, we'll, our intention at this point is really to take a uh, digital first approach, um, to continue to build our digital collections, to deliver print as a last resort. We'll roll up potentially some additional services. I'm assuming that ILL will be first out of the gate and we'll be ready to retreat at a moment's notice. As it's been said to me many, many times, don't roll anything up. You can't dismantle in less than 24 hours. And then we'll have to prepare, we'll have to think about how we welcome back modest numbers of staff who perform critical functions while still maintaining so, uh, social and physical distancing. We'll configure their workplaces, we'll decide how many of them can come back on any given day. We'll implement the university's driven protocols for elevators and corridors. We'll negotiate the cleaning schedules with our campus facilities. We'll install the signage. We'll want to have our staff uh, come back healthy, but we want them to stay healthy. And then we'll have to think about the public spaces. And so here we'll actually have the most contained public area for openings possible. 
to reduce the number of staff that are required to support them, and also to help us focus our invigilation and our cleaning uh, protocols in the smallest space. So we could start with opening our self-contained learning commons, for example, with dramatically reduced seating capacity or and the flexiglass uh, barriers at the service desk and appropriate signage. But we could live in that middle space uh, with a subset of our total campus population for some time. And you, you will notice the, the slow approach that McMaster is taking to return. It could be January, it could be the next summer. But at some point, the pandemic will end and the university will welcome back the entire community or close to the entire community back to our campus. And we call this scenario the next normal. So this is where admittedly the planning displays a more aspirational tone and, and leads us to start thinking at a more strategic level about what we want after the pandemic is over. And the truth is we, we, we pride ourselves in, in already being digitally savvy and, and already having transitioning so many of our services to digital. But frankly, there is so much more to be done and frankly as well, many of our users never got the memo in the first place. And they still thought, they still think of us as that traditional book repository. And they're charmed by all these lovely things we're doing. The pandemic has forced us to up our game. It's forced us to move to take a digital first approach to just about everything we do. And our communities are taking notice. I think the future is directing us to dramatically increase our investment in digital content, to really push the open science agenda, to assert our clear role with bibliometrics and research data management, artificial intelligence, um, virtual reality. But it's even more clear that we need to be hiring for deep tech skills throughout our organization. We need to become, as one particularly brilliant uh, RLUK uh, colleague mentioned on last week's Digital Shift uh, Manifesto webinar, we need to be trusted to work outside our traditional professional boundaries. And it's becoming increasingly clear that as we move forward, our workplaces can, will, and must change dramatically. We've proven that remote workers can be extremely productive and many of our staff are interested in having flexible work arrangements continue after the pandemic is over. I hope we'll see more focus on work-life balance, more focus on online professional development and a greater attention to enriched communication platforms. I believe research libraries in Canada and around the world are more than up to the task and working together across the global library profession through IARLA will only make it all productive. So I will close uh, with words from Margaret Drabble, when nothing is sure, everything is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fifi. Uh, our third and last speaker for this session is Helen Shenton, Librarian and College Archivist at Trinity College Dublin. Helen also has extensive experience in managing libraries. Uh, prior to joining Trinity College, she held positions at Harvard Library and the British Library, among others. Last year, she hosted the Liber Annual Conference in Dublin, and I'm now happy uh, to announce her as today. Today's third speaker, Helen, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, so I will welcome you again to Dublin. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought we might need cheering up and this is where um, um, the Liffey, which is where Guinness uh, is made and the next one, please, Matt. And um, uh, the, the river is spectacular and it, uh, this is the, the Samuel Beckett Bridge, which is even in the shape of a heart. And the next one, please and um, Silicon Docs, which was, um, this is Google and Facebook and so on, LinkedIn, uh, which was uh, instrumental in the recovery of the economy after 2010, which is very relevant, I think, and is where the second campus of Trinity is, go is going to be. And the next one, please, Matt. And this is Trinity. The key points about it is that it is absolutely city centre, it's residential, it's research intensive, um, and the next one, please. 
Um, the libraries as ever are at the center, there are more libraries, but this cluster is the 18th century long room. Uh, and then we've got a series of 20th century uh, libraries. The next one, please. Um, the key point is um, it's, it's a city center campus and we welcome 2 million visitors a year onto campus. Some of them are com commuters, but a lot of tours um, from the uh, uh, come. And one of the reasons they come is the next slide, please, Matt is the old library. We welcomed um, nearly a million visitors, the next slide please, to the long room, which is regularly called the most beautiful room in Ireland, and I miss it like anything. Um, and the next slide please, and they come, uh, visitors come to see the Book of Kells. It is sublime, as James Joyce said, it is the most Irish thing we have. And the next slide please. But also we have contemporary libraries. And for those of you who've been watching Normal People, um, a starring role was um, our libraries, particularly the Barclay Library, the, the Brutalist uh, Library there um, on the left-hand side. So we've got a whole mixture of libraries. The next one, please. We closed on the 12th of March with five hours notice. Since then, all staff have been working from home and we just have a minimum on-site secur security presence. Trinity's priority from that date till now has been the academic continuity for students. The focus was on getting the cohort of students through this year. So we flipped, as others did, all of our teaching online within a week, and we flipped 752 assessments and exams largely online. The next one, please. Our immediate response was to accelerate access to e-resources. We put out a call out to the teaching staff for additional ebook resources, we did virtual consultations, lots and lots of entry routes for inquiries. We put a lot of tutorials on how to access the e-resources and links to other e-resources. We pushed out the publisher's free content, such as JSTOR and Cambridge University Press and so on. We also repurposed a lot of the digital content we already had. We had a, a rich series of online exhibitions. We pushed those out. We also had MOOCs of the Book of Kells um, uh, a history of the book and so on. One of the issues was because all the students, it was a residential campus, the students all had to get out with eight hours notice as well, which meant a lot of our books disappeared. Fourth years, when they graduate, they cannot graduate if we, they have not returned their books. So one of the things we've done is we've worked with the Irish Postal Service. We send out prepaid envelopes to get our material back so that they can grad graduate. Um, the next one, please. We also accelerated digital in the immediate short term. We have uh, 35, actually it's nearly 50 of our staff who are working at home. We redeployed them onto accelerating the inventory to enable a major program we've got for the old library. And that will bring a lot of hidden material accessible. And with sort of caught the zeitgeist of digital first, we were about to launch one of our major programs, which is called the Virtual Trinity Library, which is a digital research entity. It's the flagship of the first ever capital campaign for Trinity. Um, and there is enough kinetic energy in that to see us through with some good news stories um, for about six to 12 months. Next slide, please. At the same time as we were doing that, I could see that there were all these different stages were gonna come down the line. So the leadership team, Right from the beginning, we drafted some criteria for future library decision making. So it was obviously around problem solving, we had to address the government guidelines, but one of our key criteria was to accelerate or do what we wanted to do anyway, our strategic directions. We wanted to be innovative. So um, the Bell Library is already, we're bringing in crowd counting technology, for example. Would it solve another problem? In Ireland, we've got a huge demographic bulge coming up. So if we don't have so many international students, could we actually then address the, the bulge in national students? And this, could we capitalize on dissemination advocacy because I could see the financial implications coming. Since then, this is a, um, a, it's a public record. We are down 40 million euro in this financial year. We're down 80 million euro next financial year. And I knew we would have to be making the case for the value of the library all along, right from the, right from the beginning. Access was obviously act to maximize access for our users, but minimize risk for staff and users. In terms of resources, we didn't want to spend a lot. 
But we wanted to um, preferably save money, not spend a lot of money, be collaborative. So that business with the, uh, the Irish postal system was um, uh, uh, thrashed out with the other Irish universities. It's very collaborative here. We tried to do it through the public libraries, actually. Um, and we also wanted to engage staff to have that sense of shared community in the problem solving. And then whatever we did, as others have said, we wanted to easily reverse it because we're anticipating a spike. Next one, please. So the government did on the um, 18th of May, this is the national uh, uh, reopening uh, phase plan. There's the five phases. The University Trinity is producing the same. I have a draft one of the library. Um, I'm not sharing it today because it hasn't been socialized with all the staff yet and therefore it wouldn't be appropriate. But we now have, we're working on this five phase and resumption of activities. At Trinity, we're calling it resumption of activities. Um, there's a group that, um, uh, chaired by the president, the provost that I'm on. Next one, please. The first, having got the students through, now our university priority is the phase resumption of research, research activities, particularly the PhDs and the master's dissertations. Then preparing for the new academic year, I've just come from council, we have agreed, we have just decided the 28th of September, we will be starting um, the new academic year. And then we've also set up a group, um, again under the president provost called Trinity Futures, which is the never waste a good crisis um, concept. The next one, please. So in terms of our researchers, um, we've accelerated access for more e-content to them. We put out a call for more e-books specifically to the researchers having done the uh, tutors before. We're giving, we're planning to give access to, what we, they need is physical, access to the physical material. So a click and collect or, or whatever. Uh, we're also looking at scan and deliver. We're also, can we flip the postal uh, service that we've got rather than bringing our undergrad books back? Can we send out um, material to our uh, uh, postgrads um, and it's around that inside out library. I always like the idea of centripetal and centrifugal. One of the particular issues we've got is that we're a UK e electronic legal library and you could only get access to this richness of material on site. So can we get access to those um, uh, that material? And then there is such a, a groundswell of desire to have sanctuary actually, particularly from uh, researchers who have um, uh, challenges in their home lives and um, poor connectivity. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a library light, lots of people. We've, we've got 3000 spaces, two, two meter, it's here, it's two meter social distancing. We know it's a, it's a, a minimum, maximum of 20, at least 20%, um, at least 80% reduction. We're looking into cellular working, pod working and so on that everyone else is doing. And then this incremental access to space. So there's no access, limited access, limited access, but no access to offsite storage, limited hours and so on through to full access. The issues we're finding is very much around, even that's complex enough, but it's the interdependencies with all the university induction because with this city center campus, we have to do health declarations. I'm an essential worker. If I go on campus, I have to do all these declarations. We have safe zone apps um, for because uh, like Imperial, we're a center for research um, for COVID-19 and there there's an issue around single workers and so on. So it's this challenges around the, what I've called the rings of the onion. Um, how do I get from home? The travel, people do not want to go on public transport. Then we've got the city, then we've got the campus, then you've got, once you're in the campus, and then you've got the libraries. And we've also got challenges around the old library. It has two functions. It has reading rooms for the research collections, which um, people then will spend a lot of time working on. And we've got all the issues around museums and galleries of, of opening up a, a center and the shop. And we've got enabling works, for example, um, this crowd counting technology was going in any way, a new Book of Kells case was being done anyway. Next slide, please. So then preparing for the new academic year, we are going to be hybrid. We're explicitly online and face-to-face -face because we're saying we explicitly value face-to-face. -face. That's not only for the student experience, but it's also because that's what we're hearing for the international 
um, students as well. So, and I was thinking, where have I already, uh, recently we've had this debate, I've got this deja vu, and we had, um, we just refreshed, completely reorganized, re, re, uh, redesigned the Trinity education, the, the, the undergraduate curriculum. And we had this debate about what is the value of face-to-face, -face, of on-site experience, and it was all around the value of co-curriculum activities. And even then before that, I remember we had the debate at Harvard, when Harvard and MIT were setting up edX about, and, and there was the debate about, if you go the full hog with MOOCs, well, what is the value of residential experience? So I think we've had these, these arguments before and have ended up with hybrids. The next slide, please. The um, organizers asked us to say what's on our minds. So that was a lot of what. And there's a couple of things that's really on my mind at the moment is the how. Crises are the easy bit. We've all just had this shared experience. And now we're going to go into fragmentation. We're going to go into fracture. Um, right from the beginning, I knew we needed resilience. Um, I'd sent out twice weekly emails to all staff. I think it's up to number 20 now. And on one of them, I embedded a video where I spoke about resilience and staying power and the need for having a slog strategy. And a lot of, of colleagues have also talked about compassion and empathy and mindfulness and so on. But the, the thing about the Irish um, situation that really, really bothers me is that, you know, the country nearly went bankrupt 10 years ago. We are, so recently, we've been the fastest growing um, European uh, uh, economy. And we're, we've already got a recruitment freeze. We're going to have, um, um, there will be lots of um, um, pay cuts and so on. And it's how do you, and, and so there's very recent memory of that. I've still got staff whose mortgages are underwater. So we've got, got to keep everyone, the morale up. And, and, and it's not now, but it's in six months, a year, two years. And, and so the whole, why I didn't share that, um, uh, the Trinity uh, Library plan is because for every activity we're setting up a task and finish group to involve colleagues. And the second point about that, the cliche about never waste a crisis. So Trinity has set up Trinity Futures and I'm going to, we're starting on Library Futures, but we're so in the weeds of doing the throws that are urgent now, I'm concerned about how do you, there's, there's, a, there's a, a disconnect at the moment. And even one question that we had from the Trinity Futures, which was how many staff could work at home, work remotely, or work 50-50? Um, and so we just very quickly, back of the envelope, worked that out. And then the question was, and what would you use any space that was released for? The ideas that came out were fantastic. They were everything from um, a digital scholarship center, open scholarship center, um, a, a low distraction study center for students with sensory disabilities, um, a one-stop genius bar, a public event space for citizen science, conservation um, on view, a writers and scholars center. So we've got, so they've got all these seeming opportunities, but we're in the throes of doing. And so that, that's, that's one of the things that's on my mind. The last slide. We hosted the LIBA conference last year. We should have been doing the IFLA, but please come back to Dublin in two years time. Thank you. Good day. And for some of you, good evening. Uh, my name is Mary Lee Kennedy, and I am the executive director of the Association of Research Libraries. Um, I'm calling you back to the next session, and I look forward um, to the three leaders who will speak with us today. Just a brief note on the Association of Research Libraries. We are a member organization of 124 libraries and archives in major public and private universities, federal government agencies, and large public institutions in Canada and the US. It is my pleasure to chair this session today with three um, incredible leaders, Jessica Gardner from the university, who is the university librarian and director of library services at the University of Cambridge, Chris Banks, who's the assistant provost and director of library services at the Imperial College, University of London, and Jill Ban, who's the university librarian at the University of Western Australia. 
Um, I also invite you to continue to contribute your questions to the Q&A function during this session that is focused on libraries in the United Kingdom and Australia. Our first speaker will be Jessica Gardner. Um, she was appointed in April of 2017 as University Librarian and Director of Library Services at University of Cambridge and is the second woman in history uh, to hold this position. Uh, Jessica, uh, many of you will be familiar with, is a committed academic librarian who has been dedicated to services that enhance student experience, experience and provide excellence in research support. So Jessica, over to you. Lovely. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, Marilee, for that lovely introduction. It is such a pleasure to join everybody. Uh, never has this kind of international partnership been so important. Uh, and we're very lucky to have Ayala um, to bring us all together. Uh, like many, I'm working at home. I'm in my kitchen. Uh, I apologize if my husband starts coming back and forth. This is the reality of working from home. So um, please bear with me. Um, I'm going to talk about the UK context uh, and I'm going to set that up a little bit on behalf of Chris Banks at Imperial uh, and myself and then go in more deeply to information about the University of Cambridge, which is quite different in some ways from Imperial, so we thought there'd be a good pairing. So in terms of the UK context, um, a few facts here. Uh, I guess um, helpful to know that uh, in terms of universities and university libraries, most of them were um, in lockdown in advance the 24th of March in the week preceding and certainly by at Cambridge, that was on the 18th uh, of March, 2020. It's a matter of record that the UK has one of the highest uh, international death rates for COVID, and that is devastating. Um, so far, that count is about 39,000, just a little bit over. At the peak in April, that was about 1,000 plus deaths a day, um, affecting, of course, whole communities. Um, by Saturday, just past the 30th of May, the recorded death levels were 205, so coming down. Um, and on June the 1st this week, on Monday, was a significant milestone for the UK in terms of some of the easing of lockdown, which the government began to trigger a couple of weeks ago. For the context of libraries, I think it's worth uh, stating that the government roadmap um, has a step three, which we will enter not before the 4th of July, and only if certain safety measures are met. And that triggers um, the reopening, partial reopening, controlled reopening of public libraries. Doesn't necessarily mean university libraries, but um, as Lauren says, this is going to increase the uh, expectation levels from communities of which we are a part. I think there's a couple of things that it is worth uh, mentioning about the UK context before I go further. Uh, the first is that universities in the UK, mostly public institutions, government funded, partly at least, mean we are subject to a very, very strong regulatory framework uh, around, particularly around students, uh, and we have been asked as universities to provide clarity to, uh, for students incoming in the coming academic year in autumn or the fall uh, with clarity about what they can expect. Not easy to do considering the level of uncertainty we all face, but you can see how that creates a particular kind of pressure at the moment for our home universities. And the second kind of UK EU uh, fact is that copyright is very different here to that in the States and schemes like Hattie Trust's emergency temporary access at the moment, it's not clear how we could utilise that, though some of us have certainly been looking. The Cambridge context, um, well, it, it, it is an ancient university, and I mention that simply because uh, we've been through pandemics before, uh, both the Black Death and um, uh, the Spanish flu, and at least one a century. I, I mean that with no complacency. This is devastating. This is a, a crisis which we are all living and working through. But it, it does give a sense of where will we be? Um, what can we hope for? What will be different? And I think that is a helpful part of our recovery planning uh, for all of us. I also want to emphasise, uh, I mean, like Imperial, like everyone on this call, we are um, a research intensive university with a very, very strong uh, breadth of academic coverage from sciences through to arts and humanities, uh, medicine and, and social sciences. And I mention that because there's a very strong physicality to what we do um, in this setting. Um, of course, our journey through recovery and the library in its normal operation uh, is strongly digital, but there's an awful lot which we cannot replicate um, through uh, remote delivery. Uh, and the scale um, is, is significant. So you're looking at a picture of the University Library, which is a main site for 
Cambridge Library Services, it's vast. Uh, it sits in a large public ground. Uh, it has 22 uh, lifts, uh, including book hoists, and it's the single largest building on the university estate uh, containing on this premises alone, 8 million books and a major special collection. We also have a very widely distributed network of other libraries that fall within um, my responsibility, including 31 separate subject faculty departmental libraries physically embedded in faculty buildings. And this conditions necessarily how we will go forward and the process for phase recovery. Uh, in lockdown, everyone, of course, has been going through rapid acceleration of digital, and that's been tiring, inspiring, and liberating in different parts. But there's a whole physical story which we have to address too. Now, again, the institutional context is slightly different perhaps than, than some others. Um, Cambridge education is based around a very, very strong um, in-person uh, student and supervision uh, model, which includes students taking part at the core of their experience in very small group supervisions, one, two, three people with a tutor, as well as all the gamut of seminars, uh, seminar groups and, and lectures. The university cherishes that part of the education it offers. It's been able to uh, create alternatives through Teams and Zoom, and that's worked in many ways very, very well. But we have a commitment, that doesn't mean to say we can do it um, for everybody, but we have a commitment to have as many students back in Cambridge as possible for the new academic year, and to be having as many facilities running safely with safe occupancy and social distancing protocols. All this is subject to all the rigorous safety checks and indeed the government uh, uh, easing of the lockdown. But I thought in terms of context, there is an expectation for us that we'll be back in some form on campus by that point. And in this summer, there is a phased reopening of research labs. Um, and with that, a limited phased reopening around some physical library collections. And I'll come back to that. What has the library been doing? I mean, versions of what we've heard wonderfully um, from Lauren and Vivian so far. I mean, our tagline has really been about keeping the libraries open online and bringing the library to you. And at the heart of our recovery plan, safety, but keeping people teaching, learning and researching. That enhancement of digital services and resources, which we all touched on, um, online content increasing through purchase and temporary access arrangements, accelerated online reading lists, online induction skills, online chat, online inquiries, um, all core to what we were doing already, but, but amplified and accelerated in this time. And we won't go back from that, of course. That has been part of the opportunity uh, that we have seized. But we are moving to reintroduce or at least expand access to physical collections which are not available remotely, electronically. And through this, never more important in our times, uh, both in relation to Black Lives Matter and uh, digital exclusion, striving for how we can approach what we do with inclusion. And I think that aspect of digital exclusion, the haves and the have-nots, is going to be one of the things that changes how we work and the priorities and the emphasis uh, for all time. In terms of how we are doing it, um, like others, we've been using scenario planning, and I found this really, really useful, um, particularly um, as I'm lucky enough to be a member of the university's um, strategic recovery task force, so able to think about how I align what the library needs to do with what the university is trying to do. Uh, but one of the benefits of that as well um, has been this close kind of thinking to the different, different matrix, different professionals, different expertises, experts around me, to be looking at things from different angles. And the scenarios have been so helpful in terms of just stopping one from going down a narrow route and, and keeping in mind the uncertainty, the need to be able to retreat, the need to be able to change, as well as thinking about what is common to all those scenarios. And for us, um, as so many in libraries, one thing that is really common um, has got to be ensuring a very strong digital layer of content and services, whatever else we do. Leaderships we mentioned a couple of times, and I, I have found, like others, this to be you know, really important to think about one's own contribution in this space. Um, the need to be even more visible, even if remote, uh, the compassion and the kindness and the generosity, which is essential to each other, and to be able to model that uh, with, with others and with our teams. But at the same time, um, a willingness to rely on a much more distributed authority um, in classic kind of crisis management, trusting expertise, functional experts, and it may not be about rank. Uh, that has been a, a good lesson and, and we've gained a, a great deal from it. Through that, a focus on community and welfare and a sense of being collectively in something together. Uh, a pause briefly on this slide. Underneath um, all the phasing and all the planning that we're doing are some 
rigorous detailed safety tests which are being used across uh, across Cambridge. A test one to ensure we can open up every one of those 350 buildings that in many cases were closed completely. The main university library had a, a, a skeleton staff for facilities and security um, present throughout and that has made our position now much simpler. But a test two, rigorous uh, safety tests that we'll make transparent to our teams about the risk assessments and safety plans for um, getting uh, activity restarted in whatever measured, controlled, partial way that is possible. We have a phased recovery plan, um, very much in the knowledge that our movement through these phases may not be linear, it may be very slow, or it could leapfrog and combine phases. So at all times, thinking about the flexibility between this. Now I'm just going to talk about the University Library, that main facility alone, because um, the faculty departmental libraries fit under this framework, but each, according to their site, will have slightly different processes through it. So we're actually at this preparation stage at the minute. Um, we're looking ahead in line with the government roadmap in the UK to potential time, if, if safely it is triggered in early July uh, or mid-July, to be beginning to put some of the services that others have talked about. Um, click and collect is our term for kind of curbside collection, um, but also a skeleton staff on site serving that and scanning and delivery services and external book drop returns. And these are what we're calling zero or no contact phases, and that could last a long time. But at the same time, we're thinking about the protocols, the arrangements, all the uh, work that needs to go underneath to move through further controlled phases um, to continue to expand access to collections not available electronically. And it is about content here. It's not about space at this point. We, we're not trying to open to be a study space. We're looking at how we can phase in um, enhanced access to material to help research continue and to plan ahead for teaching. And then that kind of resetting, you know, what does the future of our libraries look like? I think, I think we have really grasped the sense that there's no return to normal exactly as we were prior to COVID-19. And for some that will be very hard, but I think for many um, in the conversations we've had across staff um, in different kind of consultation forms that we've had, that there are elements of this which are going to make working lives better once we are through the other side a much more flexible approach to how we approach our working lives and a, in a university that's been very strong on being present, greater opportunity to think about how we might combine a combination of remote working and stop commuting in some cases will be a great relief um, where it is possible. A different balance point with the digital and physical um, I think is, is one of the biggest takeaways for us. Um, we have uh, we have accelerated rapidly in a way that I never thought we could and a way that I think um, was hard for us um, before this. I, I'm making no virtue of where we are now, but it has given us greater potential to think above the physical estate. And I think that is also true nationally. And I think that's something as RL UK will want to come back to, to thinking above the campus um, outside of our physical estate, what opportunities does that open up for us um, for collaborative venture? Certainly it's making us think locally as well. And we're thinking, of course, about the long haul and the long process globally, that we'll be dealing with significant financial challenge and a mental health aftermath of COVID-19 that is going to be with us for a long time. And that compassionate leadership, uh, that kindness and that generosity must be how we lead as we go forward. I think we're changed by this. Um, and sometimes that is hard. And other times it is about how we may be willing to think differently. Um, I think there's possibilities, but at the moment, I must admit, we're in that very hard stage of trying to work through the complexity of phasing a reopening plan in a way that is safe, it must be, above all else, but also one that really helps to bring the libraries to all our students and our staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. That is fabulous. And I sets us up very well for our next speaker who is uh, Chris Banks, the Associate Provost and Director of Library Services at Imperial College. Uh, Chris has a particular interest in open science and open scholarly communications, which speaks to the one of the opportunities before us um, that we may be able to accelerate during this challenging time and is enjoying um, many publisher innovations which have arisen from the UK and the open access policy landscape. So Chris, I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much. 
Um, so um, I'm going to talk about lifting lockdown in London and recovery and reset. So Imperial is a very different uh, institution to, uh, uh, to Cambridge. Um, we focus exclusively on science, engineering, medicine and business. So we don't have the, uh, the strong social sciences, um, arts and humanities uh, that many of the other research libraries have. Um, we're here, um, a little bit closer. Uh, we're the little red blob over on the left hand side. Uh, we in fact have uh, seven libraries uh, all together, one in South Kensington and five of our libraries are actually in hospital um, uh, settings. We are landlocked. Um, we have an incredibly, uh, so this is the South Kensington campus and uh, we are very, very densely populated and and landlocked. So it is a very, very busy campus. Um, so we're in a, uh, a densely populated capital city. Uh, very few students or staff live within cycling distance, let alone walking distance of campus. Our main campus is at the heart of one of London's busiest tourist spots. Um, that's London, um, South Kensington's Albertopolis. Um, so it's Prince Albert. Um, and as I said, five of our libraries are in hospital settings. So life after lockdown, um, we were the last of the front facing services to close our doors. The library was um, there was a feeling within uh, our senior management at the time that the library being open was a symbol of the university being open and I'm very happy to talk privately to um, others about the experience that that, um, that gave us. Um, college has not closed completely, COVID-19 research has continued through lockdown and um, certainly in the UK uh, imperial research has been in the news for a variety of reasons, most of them good. This is the one green space in campus. Uh, it's very empty at the moment and you're looking at our central library, which is the main and the largest of the libraries. So our impact of lockdown has been, as many of you, rest of you have said, on study spaces, on access to equipment, um, on our physical collections and for the National Health Service staff and other um, um, uh, non-university users, it's, it's meant a very significant reduction in the access to our collections because they often can only use our online collections on site. And it's been very bad for plants. Now, just to give you a sense of the print, our print collections in terms of, in the context of our UK libraries. So this is the total catalogued print collections of, of our UK libraries and um, Cambridge and Oxford uh, are right over on the left hand side. Uh, and there's Imperial's print collections. We are very, very heavily digital. Even in London, we have one of the smallest print collections. So in terms of our readiness for lockdown, we have significant digital collections. Over 91% of our budget is spent on online content. We have a long-standing flexible working from home policy and many of our staff are used to working from home and have been set up to work from home. We had already been using Microsoft Teams and SharePoint for some considerable months um, and we already um, have um, prepared and delivered a number of online uh, uh, courses um, to uh, match in with some of the online only course delivery that some of our uh, Imperial colleagues are doing, particularly our um, Global Masters in Public Health and also our business school, um, our International Business School um, courses, which are, are primarily online. Um, we had a business continuity plan. We had just spent a year working about it, working on it. Um, and in fact, we were about to run our first desktop exercise. We had a date in the diary. It was on pandemic preparedness. Um, in terms of what we've done there for our sustain, well, many of our services are sustainable and they've moved sustainably online during lockdown. Uh, for collection development, we are 
further sourcing electronic where possible. And we've also got an agreement with one of our suppliers that where we can only source print, that the supplier will um, send the print directly to um, the student. So that's, that's been, been a useful backstop for us. All of our inquiry, teaching, training and advice services have moved online. We've been scouring all of our um, reading lists as we were about to roll over the Leganto reading lists. We've been scouring those for print so that we can work with colleagues on, um, uh, on alternatives. And our research support um, colleagues have been very, very active, particularly for some of the COVID-19 researchers, both getting them access to um, some of the more difficult um, databases so that they could do some economic modelling right through to helping uh, publish um, uh, preprints of some uh, early uh, papers. So report nine, which is one of the ones that, that made the press a lot, um, I think has had more downloads in its first month than any other single um, uh, item in our repository has had in its lifetime. At the moment, college is working on ramping up research. Um, individual safety is paramount. We're being cautious. There's a lot of work about building red, um, readiness, um, uh, including buildings that have had no people in them at all, as many of yours have, um, and, and looking even at, at um, making sure that all the, the water systems are um, completely flush, flushed through so that we don't have any worries about Legionella or anything like that. We've just completed a two-week set of pilots which have been aimed at testing um, some research activities and a lot is being learned from that. There are some particular research projects which actually use up to 12 different lab spaces with lab equipment. So it's very, very complex. There's not a direct correlation between um, individual research, to, um, uh, research activity and a research lab. Um, we're learning about the, the new normal and managing ex expectations and there's also some early work on piloting COVID-19 testing for those returning to campus. Um, as I mentioned, we have five of our libraries are in hospital settings and a number of those uh, also contain a, a large number of research um, labs as well. Uh, we have our own testing facilities and we are piloting a, a scheme which might mean that um, on day one of returning uh, the, the thing that you do is collect a test kit and then overnight you get your test result and then people can return to work beyond that. Um, we're also using a lot of data to support um, decision making. So this is just a picture of a year's worth of, uh, of um, uh, activities in uh, teaching spaces um, and uh, from that, it's just the, the top 15 events by month. You can see the big yellow blobs in the middle uh, in August and September are our major conference seasons. And then you can see the, the green. So this shows us the type of activity that goes on um, in our teaching spaces. Um, we're also looking at actual occupancy of, um, of these spaces um, rather than planned occupancy. And we can see, as probably many of you are familiar with, that that over the term, uh, the numbers who actually uh, rock up to lectures diminish over term. So we've got it. We've now got a year's worth of, of data from an occupancy monitoring project that I launched um, a year or so ago as part of my space role. Um, so we've got a lot of really valuable data to show what actually really happens on campus, um, which can also help with our planning. We are, um, we've developed some dashboards that can take data from our um, estates plans. It can take data from our timetabling system, from our room booking system, and from actual occupancy. Um, and it can look at what social distancing modeling might look like. Um, and it's, um, it's emerging that we probably have to reduce our on-campus activity uh, by about 75% percent. But of course everything is interconnected and we can't think of things in silos. Um, so people may be in practical lab sessions, they may be collecting books, they may be printing assignments, they may be eating, studying, they may be moving around. We need to think in terms of overall how much can our campus manage. Uh, we need to think very much about the flow 
um, in and around our very landlocked campus, um, our campus that very rarely has two way um, uh, two two way um, or two sets of staircases into the into the same uh, large space. So it's it's dramatically reconsidering what we can do on campus and prioritizing activities that require um, some kind of practical in lab um, activity. In library, um, one of our big challenges early on was just selecting the scenarios that we worked to. There were so many, many possibilities that we might have worked to. Uh, but in the end, we came down to um, three ramp up uh, scenarios. Um, so we're now in the closed only. We've got um, everything's online. We then have a what we call an Occupy, which is where we manage um, all of the shelving, uh, all the stuff that was returned before we left and is just sitting around on trolleys and all the stuff that's in halls and all um, uh, and such like. And we're also looking at a scan and send service, plus possibly an RFID project because we were shortly to RFID the whole collection anyway. And the technology we're looking at has the possibility of students self-issuing using their own mobile phone technologies which would avoid all of that uh, multiple people touching the same screen in order to issue their materials to themselves. Then our next phase would be an open, I think that's what you're calling the curbside, but it would be a click and collect service uh, and then finally a socially distanced studying um, environment. Um, and we're currently working our way through our uh, plans of all of our buildings to mark out um, what spaces we think we could open up for study purposes. A huge amount of work, as others have said, in supporting our staff and in managing those longer term expectations that many of us are going to be working ho um, from home for an awfully long time yet. We all in London, we have to ask ourselves, um, why would we get on a piece of public transport and potentially risk others or risk um, key workers not being able to use um, the, uh, the public transport? So we're thinking very hard about that, but also um, look, you know, um, working uh, very closely uh, with um, some, some quite significant mental health issues, I think, as Jess has already. And then I think we have a, a real opportunity to reset our relationship with the with the publishers. Um, we need to, um, I think, tear up uh, a, an awful lot of our current agreements that are based on historic print spend that that um, are based on on factors that simply no longer pertain, uh, and that need to look at the reality that um, our, our finances are going to be very very significantly changed. Um, over the uh, over the coming years, and it gives us a real opportunity to reset that relationship. The uh, UKRI, which is uh, the main, one of the main, or the overarching body over the UK funding institutions, is having a fundamental reassessment of its open access policy, and that, combined with COVID, gives us a huge opportunity, I think, within the UK, to reset those um, those relationships with publishers. We do look forward to seeing our lions again and getting back on campus, um, but in the meantime, we can see them virtually. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Jill Ben, who's the university librarian at the University of Western Australia. Jill has significant experience in the leadership of libraries and higher education and an excellent understanding of the needs of teachers, learners, and researchers. Thank you, everyone, and, and thanks for, for having me. Um, it's great to be part of this event, um, and I'd like to just acknowledge um, our Australian and New Zealand colleagues, um, who it's very late for, or very early, depending on your, your perspective uh, at the moment. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the challenges just being faced um, by all of the colleagues on this call and the tremendous innovation um, that's been displayed, and especially our North American uh, colleagues at this difficult time, our, our thoughts are with you. So very briefly for context, the University of Western Australia is one of Australia's oldest universities um, and had a fairly traditional, mostly face-to-face -face teaching model, um, at least pre-COVID. Um, it's a research intensive university. It's ranked in the top 100 in the world. Uh, we've got 25,000 students. 
uh, and we're located on the beautiful position of the banks uh, of the Swan River here in Perth. Additionally, just for a little bit of context, uh, we're in a really different uh, position here where I am in Western Australia. Um, while there have been very significant disruptions uh, where we are, uh, we haven't experienced the same health crisis um, that we have seen in other parts of the world. In late March uh, and early April, it looked like we would be experiencing that and we could see what was happening uh, internationally. Um, but as you can see, um, over time, uh, the curve has really uh, flattened uh, here in Western Australia and in Australia more broadly. And that's largely um, because of very strict lockdown measures um, which have affected um, our university campuses, um, as well as mandatory government uh, quarantine measures in hotels um, that are enforced for returning citizens, um, as well as border closures. Uh, and at the moment, um, you can't freely travel within in Australia, our, our borders are largely closed. So for this reason, I just wanted to give you that context because I'm very much going to be focusing on the recovery um, aspect, which is where we're moving to today. I'm also going to be talking mostly um, about the institutional context, but I did want to point out that the Council of Australian University Librarians, who is made up of the 39 university libraries around Australia, as well as our eight New Zealand uh, colleagues, um, has undertaken a survey um, of its members, which shows uh, what the current scenario is in Australia. And so if this is something you're interested in, um, I put the link there. But I think what this data shows is there's a lot of diversity in the uh, Australian and New Zealand sector. Some libraries have closed and are still closed. Um, at least their physical buildings have closed. They're very much opened online. Uh, while others never fully closed, and UWA is certainly in that position. Um, so, like many of you, um, you know, we had some initial um, rapid uh, cases um, around sort of mid-March, um, and a range of lockdown measures were then came into place at the direction of the federal government, which were enacted by state governments around the country. Um, at that time, um, I refer that, to that as stage one. It was about restriction and, and very much about library reinvention. Um, at, you know, very rapidly moving our services online. This is uh, our video kiosk uh, in one of our libraries. I actually took this photo today, but this was rapidly implemented um, as we, we realised we had to do something quite different to what we'd had before. In this first stage, um, about 90% of UWA's library staff began working off campus and that was done in a matter of days. Um, I think it showed the preparedness for digital delivery and dexterity that we had been working towards for a number of years, that that was fairly, fairly seamless. Um, for stage two, um, I've called this cautious recovery and that's really the stage that we're in now. So in stage one, we did close three of our six physical libraries and that meant we were able to better manage the physical distancing requirements that the government um, really insisted that were necessary for libraries, academic libraries to stay open. Public libraries around Australia, of course, uh, were closed. Um, so on the 4th of May at UWA, those closed libraries reopened, albeit with some restrictions, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and this included 24 seven uh, access to support students during our examination period. Uh, about 80% of our staff, I would say, are still working off campus, um, but we are starting to reinstate some services. And as of Monday, that will include our document delivery and interlibrary loan service, uh, which we've paused during this time. And then we really are now planning for stage three, which I've called uh, reset and restore. Um, and, you know, pending a second wave here in Australia, we really will, I think, start to see some of the um, restrictions lift and I think we'll probably see about 85% of our staff return to campus. So m much of the focus over the last uh, nine weeks has really been about managing the risk because as I said, um, we made the decision uh, to keep some of our university libraries open during this time. Uh, and these are just some of the measures that we had to put in place. They range from reducing the number of seats 
uh, ensuring that only our UWA staff and students accessed um, the building. Um, and that enabled us to limit the numbers of people in the buildings as well as ensure contact tracing in the event that we did have a positive case on campus. Um, they included lots of, of other measures. Um, I won't go into them here, um, but I will say that it was quite challenging at some stages for students to adhere to what was required from a physical distancing perspective. Uh, and the library staff were quite creative with the signage, as you can see, in terms of the 1.5 metre message. Absolutely critical during this phase uh, was at the support of security staff on campus who were in the libraries and are still in the libraries, ensuring that students are observing the physical distancing requirements. Initially, there was a big drop off on, in the number of visits to the libraries. We would experience about 75,000 visits a week to the six libraries at UWA, you can see there a big drop off as the number of cases in Western Australia um, started, but as the curve has flattened, you can see we, we're having more and more students uh, returning to campus and that has posed some challenges uh, that we are actively managing. The other amazing thing is just the incredible increase in the use of our digital services during this um, time. Um, we have opened up some of our services traditionally only available to our staff or postgraduate students like digitization on demand to our undergraduate students. That has seen a lot of um, demand as you would expect. Um, a lot of, um, uh, as others have talked about, you know, demand for textbooks in digital format um, and incredible increases in things like our, our chat and online inquiry services during this time. So we're really now in this recovery phase at the university, and this is very much being led by a university recovery management team. When, when we were heading into the lockdown measures, the library didn't really have a visible role at university level, but I think because of the way in which we've demonstrated we can manage um, this, this difficult scenario, we've been invited um, onto a number of the work streams of this recovery management team. And this has been fantastic um, because it's been an opportunity for us to show leadership, but also contribute to the direction um, of recovery. And we're, we're uh, represented on all the four work streams there and I'm leading the venues and events stream. The recovery is very much being managed around these five core principles, uh, safety first, an incremental return to campus, giving people choice about whether to maintain their flexible work arrangements uh, and timing and acknowledging that we're not going to get everything right. We're still in a very ambiguous and complex situation and we need to learn from experience um, and uh, revise as we go. Um, the university has created some really fantastic tools and they're really guiding uh, the university libraries planning for return to work. These include a leader guide, um, all staff now are expected to complete an online induction, whether they're working on campus already or planning to, to come to campus. Um, completion of that is being tracked. Um, safe occupancy assessments are being conducted, so we know exactly how many people we can have um, in any space at any one time. Um, the library is actively managing that through our uh, people counting system, our automated system, to ensure that we have the right number of people. And of course, that is challenging because those uh, requirements are changing uh, at a state level and we're having to revise those as we go. Um, we also have been required to develop what's known as COVID-19 safety plans. That has been tr a tremendous thing to uh, consult with staff on. Um, you might have noticed we, ha we have something called COVID Take 5. So um, every morning, everybody who's working on campus gets together online uh, and talks about, you know, what are the five things that I've noticed in regards to health and safety? And this is giving our staff an opportunity to raise issues that then we're actively uh, managing around safety. Um, and the other really fantastic thing the university has done is define a return to campus framework. Um, this is very much aligned with our state government uh, phases. And it's starting to give staff some certainty about what they can expect. And for the majority of our staff, we, we are saying to them now, you know, pending a second wave, we're, we're not expecting you to be back on campus until late July 
to prepare for semester two. So that's been a really fantastic thing to work towards. So there's certainly, I think, some, some challenges in recovery. Uh, while the number of cases in Western Australia is low, there, there are some still. Uh, there was one case today, so it's not completely um, eradicated and we have to be ready to roll back as others have said. But at the same time, we also have to um, try and instill some level of confidence that we have the uh, management mechanisms in place to be able to start delivering our library services once again. I've talked about the changing federal state um, requirements that has certainly been very challenging. Um, going into lockdown was relatively easy because it was just a matter of working to whatever the guidelines were at the time. Now these keep changing, the dates keep changing, our planning needs to be agile. The financial recovery is going to be very significant um, around the world, but certainly uh, for Australian universities, we've relied heavily on international students. Um, and because of travel restrictions, it's very likely that the, very unlikely they'll be able to return. Uh, this is going to pose a real challenge for us. Um, and so we'll really have to think through, you know, what are the strategies for that? And there's a number of things being proposed at my own university. These include things like the potential for all staff to work a nine day fortnight uh, and take a 10% pay cut uh, for 12 to 18 months to assist the university in its financial recovery. Uh, this is going to have a significant impact on the way we deliver library services. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of recruitment uh, moratoriums, um, you know, restrictions in lots of different budgets as well. But of course, I think there's going to be a tremendous array of opportunities in recovery. And I think, you know, other speakers have covered these, you know, more flexible ways of working. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, a few years ago, we refurbished our main library and we moved 50 staff into another library. I can't imagine ever doing that again. We would just move those staff to working from home. We've seen such tremendous innovation and agility from our, from our library teams. It's just been so inspiring. And how do we keep hold of that and ensure it continues for the future? Um, and, I, and I just can't see us going back in terms of our virtual, virtualization of services, particularly based on the uh, increase in use of some of those services. And finally, I think that opportunity for leadership, the opportunity for the library really to play a role at the most senior level of the university in this recovery um, is something that we really need to um, take, uh, take up. So that's a very brief um, overview of what's happening, but I'm very happy to um, be contacted if you'd like any more information. Well, hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Lorraine Harricombe and I'm the Vice Provost and Director of the University of Texas Libraries here in Austin. And um, I too want to just uh, say thank you to um, Ayala for inviting me to participate uh, in this section of uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, my role will be to um, open up some of the questioning um, as well as to talk through the Mentimeter, which is um, now displayed. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, I just want to say a few quick, um, make a few quick comments. And that is that um, I'm so impressed and appreciate and want to acknowledge the resilience of librarians uh, despite the crisis. Uh, webinars like this are so important for us. I always think of the library profession and, and librarians as um, oxygen, you know, we don't think about it. We just share ideas and um, it's okay to do that. I think we are so unique in that way. So despite the rapid closure of uh, library facilities, we were probably better equipped than anybody on our campuses to move onto the platform. And that's in part, thanks to the historical investments that we've made um, in technology, in e-resources, in professional development of our staffs, the expertise they bring to the table, and perhaps most importantly, um, the trust partners that we are on our campuses. I think the campuses and the faculty joined us on the platform. We were there and then they came. And I think um, it's such an opportunity for us to leverage despite the challenges to move on towards reopening in a, in a refashioned way. 
So um, with that, I am going to turn to question one um, of the uh, Mentimeter. This is just giving us some uh, demographics of who responded to the Mentimeter. Not surprisingly, we see um, most of the RLUK colleagues here, followed by um, several of my ARL colleagues here in the United States. Um, so welcome to you all. Uh, this is very um, easily understood. Next slide, please. I'm trying to get to the questions uh, as quickly as we can. These are some of the, um, well, not unexpectedly, many of the uh, colleagues today come from libraries at research institutions. Thank you, next slide. Um, I think as we listen to today's uh, speakers, it's not surprising to see that a phased reopening is probably the most popular approach in uh, thinking about uh, opening up our facilities um, on campuses again. Um, and this has both to do with um, the experience we've had in moving very quickly uh, to online and now having more time perhaps to plan for what a post or a continuing COVID landscape might look like for us in terms of our operations, our services and our spaces. Next slide, please. Um, this question referred to what would be the priorities to focus on and it's, um, as you can see here, it's all over the map, uh, so to speak, but um, we do see that spaces uh, seem to dominate a little bit here. We've heard several people speak about um, spaces that we have invested in over years, uh, very exciting spaces to create the hubs and the gathering spaces. And now we need to rethink what those spaces might look like in a post-COVID um, um, environment or in a continuing COVID environment. Um, clearly, the financial situation for all of us weighs heavily on our minds and um, will definitely um, dictate impact and shape what we will be able to do. But what an opportunity. Um, doing this is not... Um, unusual for us as librarians. We are routinely um, struggling and wrestling with making decisions uh, with reduced budgets. And so uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that um, we are all in the same, we're all in this together uh, when it comes to um, figuring out how to reimagine what we might do with reduced budgets. Even as people, even as the Mentimeter um, is dynamic, we see the same priorities reflected here. Next slide, please. To what extent you feel that perceived role of the library has changed? Um, this was surprising. Uh, the majority, last night when I looked at this, the majority of people felt that it was just too early to tell. Um, I think now today we see that there is a sense that the perceived role of the library has changed and that preformed notions are challenged. I think we have an opportunity here to expand and enhance that narrative and that perception perhaps on our campuses. Next slide, please. What impact do you expect COVID-19 to have had on your library operations and services? Um, over and over today, we heard um, in different quotes and in different presentation, the opportunity for the library to really uh, step up and to become a catalyst uh, to accelerate some of the changes we had planned and to now execute them and implement them um, in, a, in a much more accelerated fashion than before. Next slide, please. This may be the last slide. I think this was an opportunity just to provide some comments um, on, on other ideas that people wanted to share. And um, I think you can read here, I don't want to take too much time here because I really want to get to the, um, to the questions, but uh, has there been a wholesale change in attitude among university administrators and libraries on working um, remotely? I would hope um, that this is true. Um, I wish I could take credit for this, but a colleague of mine once said, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to make sure we're at the table and not on the menu. 
I hope um, we can um, um, leverage that opportunity, given the wonderful work that libraries are doing, to really continue to embrace the core values of supporting the mission of teaching, learning, and research on our various campuses. Okay. I believe the slides will be made available and this Mentimeter perhaps too. So um, I am going to now go to the questions. We have 18 questions. We probably not get to all of them. And so I'm going to select some. Some of them are very specifically um, asked of some of our speakers. And so I will select the first one here. I hope I'm doing this correctly. Let me see. Uh, which question are you seeing now? Can somebody tell me which question you're seeing? Uh, hi, Lorraine. Um, so how are students being consulted about reopening of library spaces? Okay. Um, I haven't heard a whole lot around um, surveying students. We heard a lot about what faculty need and, and what students are using, but I wonder if any one of you would like to speak to how we engaging students. Any of the speakers. I can certainly speak about it from an imperial uh, perspective very briefly. Uh, we have students on every single one of our um, uh, task forces that are working on all elements of um, reopening up campus. So online readiness, student experience, um, there are sub task forces for all of the on campus experiences. So we have a, a, a really good and engaged group of, of, of students working with us and sometimes co-chairing uh, the, 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 the work package. Anybody else would like to respond? I can say from the University of Washington that we, um, I mentioned briefly, have had a participatory design group of students, six students that we've been paying to participate in that project, focused solely on online, but we've been getting a lot of uh, feedback from them about reopening physically as well. We also are enlisting in all of our advisory committees, so the graduate student, undergraduate, et cetera. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'll just start from Cambridge. We've uh, been, um, uh, working with our graduate union and our students union uh, and doing uh, focus groups with postgraduate research students um, in this stage given the time here we are to try and um, really gauge where we can focus our attention. I can just add from McMaster that like the previous speaker that the the focus has really been on our graduate students our undergraduate students you know they're quite satisfied with the, the demands of, of graduate students for access particularly to collections has been the the, the most pressing issue uh, with the undergraduate students we've been interacting with them on social media and having some conversations with their student government thank you uh, Lauren, I'll come back to you. This one is specifically for you. Lauren, are there any services that you haven't been able to offer besides access to physical collections and access to building or study space? Do you think that people are attending virtual events because they have time in a way that won't exist when we go back on site? Wonderful questions. Um, so yes, the collection does seem to be the primary issue, particularly special collections. Um, we are hearing a lot from folks around that. Um, it has encouraged us to think differently about how we might be able to make um, at least the content of the materials available. So it will likely shift our thinking um, as we return. Um, in terms of uh, people coming to events, um, that's sort of part of the, que the, the question. The things that we can't offer in person might not look exactly the same online. So these events often look really different too. Um, so a piece of it might be that it fits into people's lives more easily. Um, that this version is better for them than the in-person version might have been. But also, um, even at the moments where everyone was most crunched to develop their new online curriculum or whatever it was that they were doing, we still were seeing much more turnout for things not connected to that work at all. Um, we had a, a publicly engaged scholarship symposium while people were transitioning their courses and we had an outstanding turnout that was much better than our physical registration had been. So I, I think that Yes, probably more people, but uh, I, I, because of this moment and people might have the time, but also um, it, we've still seen more than we would have anticipated. 
Yeah, I think this is a trend that we see all over in terms of um, even faculty who would never sign up to come and be seen to take a, a class in a physical space are now signing up because it can be done asynchronously um, and they could be less visible or more invisible. Yeah, excellent point, yes. Yeah. Um, Vivian, I'm going to come back to you. This question is specifically, <clears throat> you prompted this question. The post-COVID strategic slides talk about building expertise in um, artificial intelligence, VR, and data science. Historically, it's been hard to recruit deep technical expertise into the library sector. So, and part of that reason is we can't pay them enough. How do you think libraries can position themselves to be as appealing as possible to those kind of expert practitioners? It, it's an excellent question and, and one that we spend a lot of time um, thinking about here at McMaster and I know in all of our institutions. Where we've found some success is, is in um, partnering with high performance computing, uh, which is, you know, one of the premier uh, research uh, groups on campus. Uh, and so, uh, for example, we have our, um, you know, our two newest hires that we're doing right now, one for research data management and one for bibliometrics. We're we're partnering with that other institution on campus and that's that's really helping us we're also um, trying really hard not to, to, to create these as library focused roles because we're satisfying campus-wide needs and so we're we're um, uh, really we're using uh, generic job descriptions that are used by central IT um, that are for um, business analysts uh, and then just catering them to the to the library world and in doing so we're able to use the same pay scales that are used elsewhere on campus to, to attract people with good tech skills. It's an excellent question. Thank you, Vivian. Another uh, a staffing related question here. Do panel, oops, can you see it? Do panel members anticipate a need to amend staffing structures to take account of the next normal, where digital has even greater importance and budgetary constraints mean that it may be difficult to get permission to recruit staff who may be underemployed on physical space management. So we're talking about staffing structures that may change in a next normal. Vivian, I think you were the one who introduced the term next normal. So it might be my job to start it off then. I, I, it's an excellent question. It relates in some ways to my last response. In terms of, of even where we're putting our, our emphasis in our new hires, where we're, the, the roles that we're pushing first um, are the digital roles, in part because we can onboard them in a remote way. Um, it's impossible to onboard someone to do physical work. Um, so it's pushing some of the, those roles uh, to the background. At this point, we're not envisioning a change in the structure, but we're certainly envisioning a, st a, a change in emphasis. Um, and we're envisioning uh, looking at, at some of the job postings with a new set of eyes, uh, with an expectation that this work will be being done, it has to be able to be done remotely um, because we, we don't anticipate that we're going to be um, able to move away from this pandemic anytime soon. Thank you, Vivian. Any others who want to respond? Um, Helen? Okay. I think, I think we will have, hello. Um, um, I think there's probably an acceleration of the, the uh, direction of travel we were going in anyway, in terms of skilling and so on. Um, being pragmatic, one of the things we've done for people who haven't been um, fully occupied um, for working from home is, is we created CPD, frankly, um, to, to do as much as possible to use the time. Yeah, thank you. Any others who would want to respond? Yeah, I'll just um, add the rain that at UWA we've had a scheme called Job Match, um, which has been about trying to match up um, skill sets across the university uh, for roles which might be vacant where people aren't fully occupied. And some of the thinking is that that Job, job Match scheme uh, will actually continue uh, post-COVID um, to you know, just look at where the resources are required as, as we recover. Thank you, Jill. Okay. Um, I'm going to this next question, which is, 
digital is great, nobody could deny it, but in our print collections, our print collections are also at the heart of many of what many of us do as our inspiring democratic welcoming spaces. How do we ensure that our print collections and our study spaces don't become neglected in the months and years to come? I will say we made huge investments in spaces, as I said earlier, certainly in our collections as well. I'm at a library with more than 10 million items myself. And um, we have, like many others, built storage facilities. But still, faculty would like to have access to that. We know there are book disciplines who rely on that, and there are librarians who absolutely want to return because they want to work with their materials. So anybody want to take on uh, this one? Um, I was just going to add, um that perhaps one of the things that begins to shift in our minds around this, because I completely agree with you, Colin, uh, our physical physicality matters enormously. It matters to disciplines in different kind of ways um, outside the arts, humanities, social sciences, but particularly within that, that set um, of disciplines. And um, I think the one of the things that changes is actually thinking, you know, how do we open up those possibilities in different ways again? So I hope that uh, we reach a point with this virus where we're able to to sufficiently phase in opening that we can have access in a um in, an, uh, in a physical way to that material and i'm sure we'll get there but also i think it should make us think about our digitization programs uh how we uh, engage with these collections online in different ways and actually both of those things are kind of amplified versions of our strategy anyway because of the opportunity then to reach new audiences online <laughs> so i don't think that replaces the need for that in person but i do think this you know, crisis has also opened up some thinking about um, how we might uh, actually extend access to just for those reasons you say because they're so important. Anybody else like to respond? Yeah I'll just um, add Lorraine that um, you know one of the my biggest uh, fears there's lots of emotional decisions that were made and and one of them was the point in time where we restricted access to our libraries just to our staff and students that was a really hard decision to make um, and at the time I thought, is this the end? You know, we've seen such tremendous use of the library and is this the beginning of the end? And, you know, as our classes all went online and we saw that return to the library, you know, all of our classes are online at UWA, but yet we had 22,000 visits last week. The students still want to come um, despite the fact that classes are online. So I, I think, you know, we've had, while most students are pretty happy with the virtual kiosks in the libraries, they're saying we want someone to talk to. So we're really trying to leverage some of that data, um, some of these experiences from our students internally within the university to promote the important role that we play. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, I, I, I also think uh, that, that we, we for all of us, I think, have had to approach this in, in, a, in not a panic, but a rush. And if we'd had mm, some time to true. plan these um, the, the the measures in terms of continuing access to stock and so on. Yes, there are national rules and regulations that we have to follow, but we may well have taken a different approach from what we've had to do, which is effectively just go straight into shutdown. And that would be something I think that uh, we would want to think about for the future, as we have other incidents of this sort of situation. How might we address the physical needs? Uh, and I think that that is something we shouldn't forget, even though we're moving as fast as we can to the digital. Thank you. I would just say how impressed I was with my colleague who spoke about their pandemic work before the pandemic had started. Uh, I think we were all quite envious of that individual's labor. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Jill, this one is for you. Many, including you, think Many, including you, I think, have mentioned the benefits of working from home. So I'm curious as to why you've decided to bring back so many staff on site. Are there particular reasons for this? Uh, thank you. Um, I think well, actually some of the demand to come back on site is actually coming from our staff themselves. Um, and, you know, one of the principles that we have uh, in terms of the university recovery is about choice. Uh, I do think that we'll see, you know, 85% of our staff working uh, on campus in some capacity, but I think many of them will maintain some time fraction uh, working from home. And I, I think that, you know, as 
time goes on, I think we'll see more working from home. I think it's been particularly um, successful for lots of teams and individuals, much more successful than than we thought. So I think we will maintain that. But as I say, we've got lots of requests. In, in some instances, we're having to say to people, you know, you need to wait um, a couple of more weeks until we can be confident of a safe environment. Thank you, Chill. And this question, I'm looking at the time, we have exactly five minutes left. So I'm going to post this question because I think it relates to um, to another question earlier that was asked uh, from Vivian, which I didn't post. So let me post this question and read it because um, Vivian, the question earlier had to do with curbside pickup. What does that look like? I've heard uh, click and collect, which I like um, as another way of stating what that looks like. So for any panelist, we're receiving a lot of pressure from some faculty in regards to stack access and spec to the um, disciplinary um, needs. There's inconclusive evidence on the virus and quarantine time for print materials. So we are taking a very conservative approach for returns, but stacks browsing is much more difficult to plan around. Have any participants begun wrestling with this aspect of access and even if it is still several months down the road? How do we plan for that browsing in the stats experience? At the University of Washington, um, we did curbside pickup for about three days before we fully shut down. So as the buildings were closing, um, we had a good sort of trial run. Um, as I believe Robin was pointing out, it was very rushed the way we did it. So we've had plenty of time to evaluate how that went and we're going to use that information when we inevitably open up curbside before the full building opens. The browsing the stacks is a really interesting challenge. We haven't gotten that pushback yet, mostly because the pushback we're getting is the demand for curbside pickup. So I'm anticipating that once we roll that service out, we'll begin hearing that same complaint or need really um, from faculty. One thing that has struck me, um, I'm relatively new in my role within the UW libraries. I was director for the Tacoma campus previously. And one thing I have learned since getting to campus is that if faculty want materials, they get it much more quickly from our remote service than from our building, because our building is sort of a labyrinth and complicated to navigate. So I've begun working on talking points around how we can get the materials to you faster if you request, especially if it's already offsite. So we're, we're using this as an opportunity to talk about speed of access, which is not the same issue as browsability, but I have found that that's resonated with a number of the faculty I've spoken with. Yes. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. I can say at McMaster, we had at least one um, request to um, tour the stacks from an individual who promised to wear his own hazmat suit. Um, and um, fortunately, most of our users are not that desperate. Uh, and I think the, our ability to do um, some uh, chapter and uh, scanning has helped, um, but the desperation is, is there. Thank you, anybody else? Um, we may have time for one question, and uh, this is one that maybe I can try, Mary Lee, Vivian. Um, I'm not aware of any UK libraries who are open at the moment. Liz is asking this, wondering if US and Canadian colleagues could comment on how many libraries are open in their countries. Um, I'll start off and I'll ask others to jump in. I know we have several colleagues from the ARL here. Um, as far as I know, most of us are in planning mode for the fall, either um, uh, to come back um, as our universities reopen um, in hybrid or potentially physical um, mode. Uh, most of us uh, are closed still. And certainly for my own institution, um, we are totally online this summer. Summer school starts tomorrow. Um, and our fall semester will start in August. We do not anticipate opening until later this summer, just for curbside pickup, for example. Others? I, well, I, I can say in Canada that there are um, a few that are in the process of planning to open small portions of libraries. Um, and in, in particular, it seems to be a need um, to provide uh, individuals with access to internet. Um, it seems to be a, a, a big push, uh, but it's certainly starting to happen in areas of our very vast country that have very few instances of COVID. 
Yeah. Are there any others who want to comment on that? Okay. Well, we, um, we're right on time here. So uh, I want to thank you all for your excellent responses and to those who posed the questions for your excellent questions. Um, this has been an excellent webinar for all of us, and it's wonderful that we could share this globally uh, via technology. And um, I was happy to meet so many new colleagues this morning myself, and I want to say thank you and wish you all well as we continue this um, phase of reopening and reimagining what we might come back as. Matt, over to you. I think it's actually over to Robin. <laughs> Well, th thank you, uh, Matt. I, I think Lorraine's just nicely ended effectively. But uh, just to say, I, I, just to echo uh, Lorraine's, a, a huge thank you to our speakers and session leaders for the fascinating and very valuable presentations and discussion, and uh, which have drawn out such that a range of experiences and different approaches, exactly what we thought when we planned this event. Uh, and uh, I just also want to take the opportunity to thank the eResearch Libraries UK executive team who facilitated the event. And to say that we're, uh, of course, to remind you that we'll make the full recording and the survey results available online. So we now return to our local recovery programs enriched by this exchange of experience. Um, I think we should also remember we need to focus above institution. Uh, and Jess made this point very strongly, I think, on collaborative approaches to reinforce our wider e information ecosystem. And I'm sure that will be a fruitful area for our IR led to progress. And I want to thank our participants, uh, everyone who came today to, on behalf of IRLA for attending the event. Uh, I suspect we might gather again in perhaps a year to 18 months at a similar event, this time to explore the changed library landscape and evolved services that have sprung from this difficult time.